All right, it is now two o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon and welcome to the next installment in our webinar series, Unpacking PREA, the North Carolina Approach to Victim Services Behind Bars. Today's webinar is titled Safety and Services for Incarcerated At-Risk Populations, Part 1. My name is Gabriella Nyman. I'm the Training and Communication Specialist with NC CASA and will be your moderator for today's webinar. Before we start our webinar, here's some basic information about NC CASA. We are an inclusive statewide alliance working to end sexual violence through education, advocacy, and legislation. We use a social justice framework. Therefore, our work is done from a strong intersectional social justice perspective. By centering our work around marginalized communities, everyone is served. Some of our work includes the Training Institute, including our online learning module, supporting rape crisis centers, resource sharing and technical assistance, legislative and policy work, anti-human trafficking outreach, prevention education, working with colleges and universities, and providing access to language services. Before we begin, I want to go over some webinar logistics. We are using Zoom for the webinar series. Many of you have been with us for the other webinars in this series, but just in case, I want to do a quick review. All participants are muted throughout. Please enter any discussion responses in the chat box at the bottom of your screen as shown in the slide. You can submit a question in the Q&A button we will have time for questions at the end, but please feel free to ask them at any time. I will be keeping an eye on them throughout. We will have a few polls to engage you throughout the presentation. These will be shown on your screen and you will be able to enter your response. The webinar will be recorded. A recording will be posted on the NC CASA website on the PREA page and YouTube channel in the coming days, along with the resources mentioned in this webinar. If you have trouble with Zoom, please email me at gabriella at nccasa.org. This, this is the fifth webinar in this series. The topics listed on your screen are those that have been previously aired and the recordings are available on NCCASA's website. We are excited to offer the training in this way. All trainings will be recorded and posted to the NCCASA website along with related resources. We will take next week off, but please rejoin us on July 7th for the second part to today's webinar. We will have a total of three webinars in July to round out our series. As you know, today is the first in a two-part webinar focused on at-risk populations. While anyone can be a victim of sexual abuse, we know that there are specific populations of individuals that are at an increased risk of victimization. Today, we will focus on describing those populations and what we know about their level of risk of sexual victimization in confinement settings. We will also look at the various PREA standards that provide a framework to protect these individuals from sexual abuse. This will provide a common understanding for part two, where, we'll, where we will focus on providing services and supports for these people. I would like to introduce you to our presenters for the webinar. Tara Graham, she, her, her, Senior Program Director at Just Detention International. Tara spent nearly 14 years working on the development and implementation of the PREA standards. Lisa Cook, she, her, hers, Jail Consultant for NC CASA. Lisa is the former Buncombe County Jail PREA Coordinator and was a DOJ Certified PREA Auditor. In her work with NC CASA, she assists in creating trainings in partnership with NC CASA and other agencies. She is the co-author of the North Carolina Approach, Creating and Navigating New Relationships to Better Serve Incarcerated Survivors of Sexual Assault, a resource we will introduce in the webinar series. Christy Croft, they, them, theirs, currently serves as the Prevention Education Program Manager at NC CASA after initially coming to the organization as the Anti-Human Trafficking Specialist. Prior to coming to NC CASA, Christy was an advocate and support group facilitator at a local rape crisis center and facilitated independent community-based consent education. I will now hand over the webinar to Tara. Great, thank you, Gabriella. 
Um, as many of you know, Just Detention International, or JDI, is a health and human rights organization that seeks to end sexual abuse in all forms of detention. JDI's partnership with NC CASA and this webinar series fits perfectly with how JDI does its work. We work with corrections officials, rape crisis advocates, and policymakers to make detention facilities safe. We promote public attitudes that value the dignity and safety of people in detention. And we support incarcerated survivors of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Like I have shared in all the other web webinars, at JDI, we believe that no matter what crime a person may have committed, rape is not part of the penalty. To get things started today, we're curious about who is joining us today. Gabrielle is going to launch a poll, and we'd like everyone participating to tell us where you work. Are you with an advocacy organization, a North Carolina jail, a North Carolina prison, or something else? So take a minute to go ahead and log your response, and if you're with an, an organization that isn't listed here, um, please go ahead and put where you work um, in the chat box. Great, I see someone says that they're here from UNCG. Um, oh, and someone uh, is from Minnesota, welcome. Thanks for joining us today um, at a rape crisis center called SOS Sexual Violence Services. Thanks for joining us, this is great. All right, I'm going to give everybody another 10 seconds to uh, fill out the poll. We also have the Wilson County Sheriff's Office joining us and the Commission of Indian Affairs, a former CDCR, so I presume with California. So thanks for joining us, that's exciting. So it looks like 81% of our participants are from advocacy organizations, um, zero from jails and zero from prison and 19% from others. Okay. Great, thank you so much for that, Gabriella. It's wonderful to have everyone with us today. Um, I'm sad that we don't have anyone from a North Carolina jail or prison joining us, um, but I am excited for those of you that are here. Um, we also have someone from Safe Haven um, for Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're gonna do one more poll. Um, so I'm curious, I know I just doing a quick scan of participants, I see a few familiar names, um, but I just wanna see how many webinars in this series you've watched. So let us know. Is this your first? Have you been to almost all of them or have you been to all of them in this series? Take a moment to let us know. I'll go ahead and end the poll in another 20 seconds. All right, so it looks like 33% um, of people say this is my first webinar, 52% of people say almost all of them, and 15% of people say all of them. Wonderful, that's really helpful information. Um, I just wanna let people know, I mean, I know we've already mentioned it, um, that the recordings for the other webinars are on the NC CASA website. Um, I will, we're far enough into the series that as uh, those of us presenting will make uh, comments and refer to previously viewed webinars. So uh, just know that when we make those references, we encourage you to certainly go back and watch those webinars. Um, so we'll go ahead and move forward. So as we've talked about in the other webinars, please remember to practice self-care. These webinars are chock full of information, this one today in particular. Um, and some of it I know can be upsetting or challenging to listen to from time to time. So if you need to, please take a break and come back when you are able. 
Like Gabriella mentioned, anyone can be at risk of sexual victimization. Unfortunately, there are certain populations who are at an increased risk. Specifically, we are going to talk about lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex individuals, people who are deaf or hard of hearing, people for whom English is not a first language, people with disabilities, and people who have a mental illness. As you can imagine, this is a, a wide group of individuals and we could spend individual webinars on each. So, um, but today what we're gonna do is focus on this group, a diverse group of individuals. And, and given the amount of information we'd uh, like to cover, today's webinar will be a foundational understanding for who these people are and appropriate terms to use and protections that are included in the PREA standards. In part two, after the 4th of July, we will take this information and provide you with guidance for how to support these individuals. I wanna to start today with a video of Troy Isaacs. That's who you see on our screen. Troy is a member of JDI's, um, sorry, he is a survivor of sexual abuse in both juvenile and adult corrections facilities. He is also a member of JDI Survivor Council and generously gives of his time and of his story to educate others about the importance of protecting people from sexual abuse and confinement. I'm gonna show the video, I'm gonna change my screen so we can see the video. Um, it's just over two minutes long, so it's not very long, um, but I wanna just let you know that he will speak about sexual abuse. So if you need to, you can press the mute button um, and then come back and join us in a couple of minutes. So bear with me as I share the screen. support services um, for young people um, in juvenile hall. When you are in juvenile hall, you don't know what trauma is. You're young, you're young, so you're vulnerable. I didn't know anything about that. You know, uh, being forced to do things in showers, being harassed by gang members. I knew nothing about that stuff. Inmates have a code of silence. So it's, it's very hard. And even if you're LGBTQ, it's even harder to speak out. Having rape counselors come into a facility to speak with individuals that have been sexually abused. Uh, I think that's really phenomenal. Inmates need to be taken seriously. You have to have empathy, understanding, compassion for inmates that are incarcerated that are speaking out about their um, sexual abuse. Everyone deserves to be safe in the prison system. I want people to put a face, a human face, on what I'm saying. I just don't want to be just a number. And in most cases, people that are incarcerated are just a number. So special thanks to Troy, um, again, for giving up his story. Um, let me, I'm going to swap and go back to our slides. Just bear with me. Um, and hopefully folks are able to see my slides again on the screen. Um, so again, thank you to Troy for sharing of that. He, um, as you can see, he's a very engaging individual and there are other videos of Troy um, on our website or if you go to our YouTube channel, um, you, can, you can access those videos there or other videos of survivors. Um, but as we continue, and for those of you that joined us for the second webinar, which was the PREA 101 webinar focused on victim services, the victim services PREA standards, there are approximately 2.2 million adults and about 60,000 youth who are incarcerated in U.S. prisons, jails, and youth facilities around the country. As we noted then, due to COVID-19, these numbers have decreased especially for individuals who are low-level offenders and individuals who have underlying health conditions or who are elderly and at increased risk for negative outcomes in contracting COVID-19. These numbers are constantly fluctuating. So what we present today are based on data that was accurate prior to the pandemic. 
If you want to learn more about who is incarcerated in the US and in North Carolina, I encourage you to watch the second webinar in this series, like I said, the one on PREA 101. Federal surveys of individuals in custody reveal that in a given year, approximately 200,000 people are sexually abused in confinement settings. This is based on data collected before the PREA standards were released. We are hopeful that this number has decreased as we saw in the new reports released in 2019 on incidents of sexual abuse in juvenile detention. But even one sexual abuse is too many, so there is still lots of work to do. These same surveys provided other information about the individuals who reported sexual abuse. What we learned is that certain populations of prisoners are in an increased risk for victimization. In fact, some are at significantly higher risk. Prisoners who disclose a mental illness or developmental disability were three times more likely to be sexually abused. 80% of inmates with a severe mental illness who were abused by another inmate were sexually assaulted more than once. Lesbian, gay, and bisexual prison inmates were six times more likely to be sexually victimized than the general population. And transgender inmates, and I should be specific that these are transgender women in male facilities, were eight times as likely to be sexually abused as the general population. And individuals who were previously victimized were six times more likely. It is especially important that the appropriate steps be taken to safeguard such inmates and to address things such as sexual harassment before they escalate into something serious. We will look at other populations for whom we do not have data about risk of victimization, but who might also be at risk, and we will discuss the reasons why. And one last note, we had chosen to frame the discussion around people who are at increased risk of victim, sexual victimization. We chose not to use the term vulnerable because none of these people are inherently victims. Rather, it is the perpetrators who look to target people they perceive as weak and those who are less likely to report sexual abuse and less likely to be believed when they do report. For example, people with disabilities often face communication and mobility challenges in a society that is not designed with them in mind. In fact, a fact that perpetrators use to their advantage and that corrections facilities must do a much better job at addressing. Um, I'll now hand things over to Lisa. Do we, um, actually, Gabriella, do we know, has Lisa been able to join us? Uh, no, it doesn't look like Lisa has showed up yet. I texted her, so hopefully okay. back. Not a problem. So I'll go ahead and continue and talk um, about uh, individuals with disabilities who are in confinement settings. So first I want to share an account from Jerry, an incarcerated survivor with physical disabilities who describes why it can be risky for a prisoner with a disability to report sexual abuse. He says, and I quote, I was born without fingers or toes. I have to rely on staff for my daily needs more so than does the average prisoner. I served as a prison facility clerk and worked directly for the chief administrative staff. I was regularly sexually abused by the facility's assistant and superintendent. This went on for a while and I was afraid to say anything for I was afraid of being transferred to a prison where I would be further abused and my disability needs would be ignored, end quote. As Jerry described, he has to rely on others throughout the day. It is this kind of help that can set someone up for being preyed upon by a perpetrator of sexual abuse. The perpetrator can act as a helper, but then take advantage of the individual knowing that they may fear asking for help. You may be thinking, how do you define disability? The Americans with Disabilities Act defines the disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, ranging from performing manual tasks to seeing, hearing, or eating, as well as functions involving the immune system, normal cell growth, brain, respiratory, and reproductive functions. I should also point out that the distinction between developmental disabilities and acquired ones. A developmental disability originates at birth or becomes apparent during childhood. It is expected to be present throughout the person's life and affects the person's functioning in major areas of life. Developmental disabilities can be physical or intellectual. An acquired disability is just that, a disability that was acquired at some point in the person's life, after birth or childhood. It might have been as a result of an accident or illness, drug or alcohol addiction, or something that happens due to someone's age. 
acquired disabilities can be physical or intellectual. While definitions of disability are important in that they are key to providing legal protections for people with disabilities, they are nevertheless medically focused and ableist in that they depend upon what is officially deemed to be an impairment. And we know that there can be very different opinions about what does and does not constitute an impairment. I'll pause now and say a word about language. As we know, language is an important way to show respect and honor dignity. People first language is a way to demonstrate an understanding that a disability is just one part of a person's identity. The person comes first and their disability second. Here are some examples of respectful language. A person with a disability, such as John, has a disability. A person who uses a wheelchair, Sally uses a wheelchair. A person with an intellectual disability, Raymond has an intellectual disability. A person with autism, Tina has autism. We don't say Tina is autistic. And a couple of additional important examples. Intellectual disability is now the preferred term for what, what was once called mental retardation. And dis, developmental disability is, an, is another commonly used term. In general, it is recommended that you refer to a person's disability only if necessary and according to person first language. We also encourage you to be mindful of ableism, which is discrimination in favor of people without disabilities and attitudes that characterize people with a disability as being somehow less than or inferior to people without a disability. We would like to acknowledge that people with disabilities and their bodies are not inherently less. Instead, it's ableist attitudes that marginalize people with disabilities. You may be thinking that the definition for disability is quite broad, and you are right, it is. What this means is that there are a tremendous number of people who have a disability. About 15% of people in the community have a disability. But when we then look at people in confinement, this number jumps drastically. In short, people in state and federal prisons are three to four times more likely than people in the community to report having at least one disability. The most common reported disabilities for people in confinement include hearing, vision, physical, and cognitive disabilities. Over the next few slides, we will describe each of these a bit more. First, we will talk about hearing impairments. A hearing impairment can range from being hard of hearing to being deaf. People are considered deaf if their hearing loss is such that they are unable to understand speech and must rely on vision for communication. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, or BJS reports, 7% of inmates report being deaf or hard of hearing. This includes people who are late deafened, that is, who were born hearing but experienced a significant hearing loss later in life due to aging or illness. For the purposes of this conversation, it's important to note that prisoners who are deaf or hard of hearing have great difficulty getting around a facility. In order to centralize accommodations for them, deaf inmates may be in a housing, housed in a single prison within a state system. They may also be required to wear vests to indicate to others that they are deaf or hard of hearing. There are typically also modified procedures for verbal announcements, such as flickering lights or door-to-door -door, door -door notifications. And referring back to the earlier point about mm -hmm. what counts as a disability, it's important to remember that many deaf people use a capital D in the word deafness, as you see here in this slide. The, the use of the capital D with deaf is a means of differentiating people who identify with deaf culture and identity and those who consider their deafness to be simply a physical lack of hearing and do not necessarily identify with that broader community. Deaf people who use the capital D often do not identify as having a disability, but as members of a cultural group with language, customs, and shared norms. So while we refer, we will refer a couple of times to people who are deaf as people with disabilities, this is because of the legal protections that we'll discuss today apply to deaf and hard of hearing people. This doesn't take away from their rights to self-determination for those who do not see themselves or their community as having a disability. If anyone is interested in learning more, JDI has a separate webinar series, a web, separate webinar, excuse me, <laughs> devoted to working with deaf and hard of hearing incarcerated survivors that is available on our website. A link will be provided at the end of this webinar. The BJS reports that 7% of um, inmates also have a visual disability. Vision impairment can range from relying on glasses to blindness. Some corrections agencies define vision impairment 
as when an inmate is unable to see or read. To facilitate accommodations for blind prisoners, some corrections agencies house these prisoners together in a single prison. These inmates are typically provided with support that includes canes, inmate assistance, help with reading and writing, assistive reading devices available in law libraries, and upon request, large print materials, audiobooks or recordings, computer text to talk, and library Zoom text technology, which can be a way to enlarge text or to screen read. These prisoners are often required to wear vests to, to facilitate identifying them. Without these auxiliary aids and services, inmates who are blind or have low sight are unable to take part in programming and routine activity in the facility. Keep in mind, though, that receiving needed accommodations still does not always happen promptly. Corrective eyewear, repair, or replacement can take months for someone to receive. Now we'll move on to physical disabilities. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, about 10% of U.S. inmates report an ambulatory disability. Mobility impairments include any limitations in transporting oneself and may include the use of an assistive device such as a wheelchair, walker, or cane. In detention, inmates with a physical disability typically receive housing accommodations like ramps, grab bars, lower bunks, lower tier housing, or extra mattresses. Facilities may need to make modifications to the path of travel for the inmate to get to the dining hall or to a program or assignment. Typically, they are not required to stand up for count. That's where they count all the individuals in the facility, and this happens multiple times a day, or to get down on the ground for an alarm or lockdown. They may also be required to wear vests, vests that indicate their disability. A cognitive disability affects a person's mental processes, the ability to think, make decisions, and navigate their environment. A person can be born with a cognitive disability or it can be caused by trauma. It is a term that is used to describe diagnoses as different as Down syndrome, traumatic brain injury, learning disorders, and dementia. The Bureau of Justice Statistics finds that among disabilities experienced by prisoners, cognitive disabilities are by far the most common, affecting nearly 20% of prisoners in American prisons and jails. Remember that people with cognitive disabilities might not have the same vocabulary to talk about sexual abuse and sexual harassment as other adults because they may have been shielded from sexual health education in the past. As advocates, and I know that many of you are joining with us today, using simple and clear words and checking for understanding will help, help ensure communication is working. People who have cognitive disabilities and mental illnesses, especially those who have been in institutions like schools and groups homes, are often taught that the most important thing they can do is to comply with caregivers and authority figure instructions. Given the value placed on compliance, people with cognitive disabilities may respond that they understand or that everything's okay, even if it's not. When you work with them, use scenarios and examples to make sure that the people actually understand what they have been told. Instead of asking someone, do you understand how to make a report of sexual abuse or sexual harassment, which will receive a yes or no answer, ask them instead to explain to you what they would do if they needed to report feeling unsafe. Here we have Loretta, a prisoner who has a physical disability and shares the challenges that she and other prisoners with disabilities face. And I quote, we need help. No one cares about us here and we have no support for our community and what we need. I use a cane and I'm afraid of falling all the time because it's not accessible here. If I can't get around, then I am limited in what I can do. So sometimes I do nothing. Then I get real depressed, end quote. Not surprisingly, living under these circumstances causes tremendous distress for prisoners with disabilities. This is in addition to the high incidence of trauma that they may have been grappling with their, in their lives in the community. The Bureau of Justice Statistics found that compared to those without a disability, prisoners with a disability were about four times more likely to report serious psychological distress in the past 30 days. And jail inmates were twice, two and a half times as likely. A study in 2010 found that people with serious mental health problems are over three times as likely to wind up in a prison or jail than in a hospital. I'm sure this is not something that is new to anyone on, 
joining us today. People with mental illness are drastically overrepresented among people who are behind bars. Many are locked up for minor offenses like theft, drug use, or disturbing the peace. As is often the case, the offense of a person who has a mental illness, especially those of the kind I just mentioned, is directly related to his or her illness. As a result, prisons and jails have become the de facto psychiatric hospitals in our society. As with the overall inmate populations being demographically different from the US population, the prevalence of severe psychological distress among prisoners remains significant when, compar when comparisons are made to other demographic subgroups most commonly held in prisons and jails. According to BJS, prisoners and jail inmates are three to five times as likely to have met the threshold for a serious psychological distress as adults in the general U.S. population. The percentage of prisoners who met the threshold for serious psychological address, distress as adults was more than three times that of the, uh, of the adults, sorry, in adults in prison was three times that of adults in the U.S. general population or in the U.S. general population with no criminal involvement in the last year. Few corrections facilities have enough trained staff or resources to offer adequate medical health care within their facilities. Corrections mental health staff who work in the facilities describe having caseloads that include um, hundreds and hundreds of individuals. And as a result, mental health staff often scramble to provide really basic emergency services. Unfortunately, this means that many inmates who desperately need more intensive help or who need therapy go untreated. We want to make sure to distinguish between cognitive disabilities and mental illness. Cognitive, cognitive disabilities and mental illness sometimes occur separately, but can occur together in varying degrees. Both cognitive disabilities and mental illness have an impact on how a person perceives and moves through the world but they are different from one another in several key respects. Here's a list on your screen, but by no means complete, of some of the most important ways a cognitive disability differs from mental illness. The biggest general difference between the two is that while mental illness may be a temporary condition, a cognitive disability is likely to be permanent. In keeping with that, a cognitive disability, unless caused by a traumatic injury, usually is expressed at birth or during development while mental illness can start at any age of a person's life. A cognitive disability generally is not treatable by medication, while patients with a mental illness can be aided by prescribed drugs. A cognitive disability will be typically diagnosed by a psychologist or a general practitioner, whereas mental illness will be assessed by a psychiatrist. This next point is a subtle one, but important. A cognitive disability acts as a barrier on a person's thoughts and ability to understand. A mental illness, on the other hand, can disturb thought processes and affect a person's perception of reality, expressing itself in hallucinations, for example, Down syndrome, or Down syndrome, learning disabilities, autism, dementia, and traumatic brain injuries are all cognitive disabilities. Diagnoses such as depression, anxiety, and schizophrenia are mental illnesses. We're gonna, let me pause here for a moment and welcome Lisa. I know she's here joining us today. Welcome, Lisa. And before I hand things off to Christy, I just wanna see, Gabriella, if we've had any questions submitted so far. No, nope, it doesn't look like we've had any questions, but if anybody has any, please feel free to, chat, to type them into the chat box. Great, so we'll give just a second um, to see if anyone has any questions about what we've discussed so far. Um, and then I'll hand things off to Christy um, to take things from here. So seeing no questions right now, and we'll continue to pause throughout and again at the end. So please, if you have questions, feel free to add those. Um, but right now I'll go ahead and hand things off to Christy. Christy. All right, thank you so much, Tara. Um, so we're going to be talking a little bit about LGBTI prisoners in confinement and go over just some language and frameworks and tips um, for helping, um, helping support them, especially when they are survivors of sexual violence and, as Tara already mentioned, at increased risk. So next slide. So I want to go a little bit over what we mean by SOGI. When you hear us say SOGI, it's 
it's not an identity or an orientation, so it's not synonymous with LGBTQ, for example. Soji is a word that sort of means like race would, where you're describing that someone has um, an identity or an orientation, but you're not tell it doesn't give you information about what that is. Soji stands for sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. And we all have an orientation, identity, and expression, so all of us have SOGI information. SOGI is information that we have, orientation and identity are things that we are. So let's break this down a little bit. Your sex assigned at birth is, refers to our bodies. You were born, the doctor took a look and said, congratulations, it's a boy, or congratulations, it's a girl. This is largely determined by our anatomy and our DNA, but some people's anatomy or DNA don't fit that binary. Almost 2% of all people are born intersex, which means that their genitalia or DNA don't fit the binary that we expect, and many of those people are not identified as intersex until adulthood. Gender identity refers to an innate and deeply felt sense of who you are. Are you a man or are you a woman or are you non-binary or gender fluid or some other identity? Non-binary means you do not identify as a man or a woman. Transgender means that someone's gender identity does not match the sex they were assigned at birth. And if you ever hear the word cisgender, that means that someone's gender identity does match the sex they were assigned at birth. And we use these words as adjectives. You might say a transgender woman or a cisgender boy. Transgender is not a separate category from man or woman. It's not like we have men, women, and transgender people, as that would make it sound like, um, you know, that it's a separate category when in reality some men and women are transgender. Um, but transgender does describe how that person's identity relates to their biology at birth. Sexual orientation refers to who you are attracted to. It is not the same as your gender identity. The identity, again, is who you are. Your orientation talks about who you are attracted to. Gender expression refers to how someone expresses their gender to the world in terms of dress, mannerism, style, Someone's gender expression does not always match their gender identity, and that doesn't change their identity. For example, a woman who has a more masculine gender expression is still a woman, whether she is cisgender or transgender. And non-binary people may not be perfectly androgynous in expression, and they are still non-binary. Next slide. I want to spend a few minutes reviewing terminology to make sure we are all on the same page. And like we showed with the previous slide, we all have a gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation. LGBTI incorporates concepts that include gender identity and sexual orientation, and we're going to break those down a little bit more. And we'll start with sexual orientation. The L is for lesbian, and a lesbian is a woman who is physically and emotionally attracted to other women. Gay can refer to anyone of any gender, but is frequently used to refer to a man who is physically and emotionally attracted to other men. Bisexual describes someone who is physically and emotionally attracted to people of the same or a different gender from themselves. And some people even identify as pansexual, which is similar. Pansexual means they are physically and emotionally attracted to all genders, anyone of any gender. And then looking at your identity, the T, transgender, describes someone whose gender identity does not match their sex assigned at birth. For example, someone who was assigned female at birth and identifies as a man is a transgender man. Similarly, someone who is assigned male at birth and identifies as a woman is a transgender woman. And by the way, that's the language you'll want to use. Assigned male at birth or assigned female at birth is the language that we use to describe um, someone's gender assigned at birth. Neither the words transgender nor the words cisgender are slurs. They're just descriptive words that can be helpful in understanding someone's experience. The I is for intersex, which we described earlier, and intersex is when someone's sexual or reproductive anatomy or chromosomal pattern does not fit typical definitions of male or female. The PREA standards also use the phrase gender nonconforming to describe a person whose appearance or manner does not conform to traditional societal gender expectations. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about transition because this is something that some people um, 
struggle to understand and wrap their minds around. And when the word trans transition is used with a transgender individual, many people assume it relates to gender-affirming surgery. That is, surgery that modifies a person's body to align with their gender identity. And some transgender people choose to undergo gender-affirming surgery, but not all do. Some may not want to have surgeries, uh, and some who do want to have surgeries might not be able to afford it or otherwise access it. For individuals in detention, they may not be able to access medical options or may be forced to discontinue efforts while in confinement. Transition relates to a lot more than surgery, though. It can include social, medical, and legal transitions, as described on this slide. Social might include coming out to your friends and family, letting people know your pronouns or a new name if those change. It might involve wearing different clothing or other aspects of your presentation to include speaking, walking, and your mannerisms to align with your gender identity. It might include medical, which can include going on hormones to um, affirm your gender identity, surgeries, hair removal, other kinds, of, um, other kinds of medical treatments someone might have to have their body be more in alignment with their identity. And it can also include name change, um, some legal changes, your name legally changed, having your identity documents updated to reflect your gender identity. People may choose not to transition at all. Or they may choose to only do some kinds of social transitions, but never anything medical. It is up to the individual to decide what they want to do and if they decide to transition, what that means for them and what they decide to do. Um, so people may make different choices around that. For some people, the decision to socially transition means they can stop policing their forms of expression and movement for fear of what someone might say. They are able to relax and maybe experience less dysphoria, which is a word that describes the psychological sense of unease and overwhelm that many transgender people feel when their bodies do not align with their identity. The Williams Institute out of UCLA does national research on LGBT individuals, and this graphic explains the rates of people in the community who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and then the rates of gay and bisexual men and lesbian or bisexual women who are in prisons in the U.S. As you can see, there is a disparity for both groups, but a tremendous and staggering disparity for lesbian and bisexual women. So we're going to look at some of the experiences of transgender people. One in six trans people have been incarcerated at some point in their lives. And this is from the National Center for Transgender Equality. And here in this graph, we have that statistic visualized. Data collected by the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the National Transgender Survey in 2011 show that although trans folks are a small percentage of the overall population, estimated to between one and 3%, they're at high risk of experiencing incarceration over the course of their lives. The average rate of incarceration for all U.S. citizens, represented by the gray bar on the left, is about 5%. On the right, the orange bar represents the likelihood that someone who is trans will be incarcerated at some point over the course of their lives, and that likelihood is 16%. Within the trans community, trans women have much higher documented rates of incarceration than trans men. You may be wondering what experiences LGBT individuals have experienced to lead to these kinds of disparities. Research notes that trans youth are more likely to leave school due to harassment, physical assault, and sexual violence. They're more likely to experience homelessness, to suffer verbal and physical abuse in a range of public spaces, including at crisis centers and shelters. And these homophobic or transphobic experiences often lead to people who are LGBTI being excluded from formal economies. As a result, they are more likely to engage in criminalized behaviors like sex work or involvement in the drug trade or violent acts of self-defense. These crimes of survival, in turn, lead to increased police stops and arrests for LGBTI folks. Once LGBTI folks enter a confinement setting, bullying, harassment, discrimination, and harsh punishment conspire to keep a vicious cycle as harassment and excessive discipline leads to trauma, missed school, and potentially higher rates of recidivism. Hmm, I 
I think we might have skipped a slide that I had in my notes, but that is cool. So we'll move on to challenges for LGBTI inmates. So now I want to take all of what we have just described and add on even more. Um, that's right, LGBTI survivors face even more challenges to their safety, including homophobia and transphobia while incarcerated, bullying, negative language being misgendered or um, called by a name that is not your name, rigid gender roles, lack of being seen and respected by staff for who they are. These challenges are coming at them from other inmates and from staff. With respect to being seen for who they are, many facilities are not accommodating to the gender-specific needs of transgender inmates. This is especially true for transgender inmates who are housed based on their sex assigned at birth and not in a facility that aligns with their gender. So for these inmates, they may not be allowed to express their gender as desired and may be prohibited from purchasing gender-specific commissary items as a result. For example, a transgender woman may not be allowed to wear her hair long, may not be issued a bra or allowed to purchase one, may not be allowed to purchase and wear makeup, and may be forced to wear boxer shorts like the male inmates at the facility. Transgender men in a women's facility may not be allowed to grow facial hair and may not be issued boxers. Lack of access to appropriate gender expression increases dysphoria, and it also increases exposure to bullying and violence. And while some people identify as LGBTI, there may be people who are perceived to be LGBTI, whether they are or aren't, and are faced with these same challenges. And these challenges just keep growing. Prisons and jails, we know, can be dangerous places, and this is especially true for LGBTI inmates. Some of the safety challenges they face include unsafe housing, abusive and inappropriate searches, protective pairing where someone offers protection in exchange for sex, and um, that's frequently perceived as a lover's quarrel instead of being recognized as sexual abuse by another inmate. They might experience sex trafficking, being bought and sold for sex inside the prison. And they also suffer from the perception that trans women are predatory and that trans men are victims, and these perceptions are layered on top of other assumptions about race. We hear from LGBTI survivors of them being blamed for their own sexual assaults. We've heard from gay male and trans women survivors that staff basically told them they must like being sexually assaulted by other men, that they create problems or that they call attention to themselves with their gender expression, which is victim blaming and completely ignores the role of consent. They're also told they should man up. So um, the BJS reports tell us that more than one in three gay and bisexual men were sexually abused while in custody, whether by staff or by another inmate. And um, for women, the situation is also critical. Lesbian and bisexual women are twice as likely to be sexually abused by staff than their heterosexual peers. And you can see these statistics on the slide. Prison and jail, um, they are often uh, sexually abused by other inmates. Sorry, Christy. It looks like maybe mm -hmm. uh, we skipped the notes for this one and then here it's okay i'm just going to go forward to show the next slide where you talked about the one in three men all and right got it this, this is for the women there we go thank you so much tara yeah not a problem and here's the next one there we go so sexual abuse of transgender prisoners we know that the bjs estimates there were over 3,200 transgender people in the U.S. prisons and 1,700 transgender people in jails nationwide at the time of the survey in 2011 to 2012. Transgender prisoners were victimized at rates nearly 10 times those for prisoners in, gen in general, and that's 4% in prisons and 3.2% in jails. So it's startling to think that it's estimated that 40% of incarcerated trans women are sexually abused each year. And I'm going to turn it back over. Great. Thank you, Christy. Um, let's pause here and see if anyone has any questions for Christy. Okay, we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, again, don't forget to submit questions to the Q&A section. I know this is a lot of information today, um, so please feel free to ask your questions. Um, and we'll go ahead and move forward. 
So the final population we're going to be talking about today are individuals who are limited English proficient or LEP. This means someone for whom English is not a first language. Spanish is the most common language for individuals who are LEP in confinement. However, they can be individuals who speak any number of languages. Some individuals may speak a little bit of English, enough to get along day to day, but may have difficulty understanding and communicating complex topics, including sexual abuse or sexual harassment. Others may not speak any English at all. Limited English proficiency in facilities can place individuals at increased risk of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. Unfortunately, we do not have numbers of rates of sexual abuse for these individuals, but not being able to communicate can make people feel isolated. As we have mentioned earlier, perpetrators look for individuals who may be isolated or may not be able to report what is happening to them. A perpetrator may connect with an LEP prisoner to offer support and help, possibly offering to translate for them and using this help to pressure someone into having sex. Facilities often have materials only in English or maybe some materials in Spanish, but not every language that people need. This is often the case for all services, again, isolating people and not providing them the services they are supposed to have available. Some individuals in jails may be held not because they committed a crime, but because they're in the US illegally. Jails will enter into contracts with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, to hold these detainees. Not only may these individuals not speak English well or at all, there may be other challenges they face as a result of their immigration status. For example, they may have fled their home countries due to violence or persecution. Now in detention, they may continue to fear for their safety. The U.S. legal system may be confusing and complicated and they may not have ready access to legal counsel about their immigration case. Furthermore, detainees may fear reporting sexual abuse or sexual harassment because they think it will negatively impact their immigration status. The PREA standards are a tool that corrections staff and advocates can use to navigate providing services to incarcerated survivors. Additionally, because of the rates of victimization of certain populations, there are specific provisions that provide added protections to, for those individuals. As many advocates do with people in the community, it is helpful for you to be able to notice if someone's rights are being violated, to educate people on their rights, and if they want you to, advocate on their behalf with agency officials. In the following slides, I will describe the different standards so you can understand how you can use them to your advantage in your advocacy. Those of you familiar with the PREA standards know that there are more than 50 standards that govern adult prisons and jails. With each standard broken into multiple provisions, and I will spend some time going over just a few of these standards. Please note that the slides do not include the full text of the standards. Rather, we've pulled out the key concepts for this webinar. We will also not review all of them in detail and have focused the following slides on those standards that are important for advocates to know about. I encourage you to review all of the standards. I also encourage you to go back to this webinar found on NC Costa's website as a reference to draw from as you learn about the corrections facilities where you will provide services. I want to highlight that employee training standard. Staff are to receive PREA training initially and then refresher training at least every other year. Standard 11531 includes a, a long list of topics that staff must receive training on. This list is broad and how facilities choose to conduct training is at their discretion. The training standard does explicitly state that staff must receive training on how to respectfully and professionally interact with LGBTI and gender nonconforming prisoners. As we walk through the standards today, note that even if we do not mention it explicitly, staff are to be educated and receive training on all of these standards. Another standard we want to mention briefly is the Supervision and Monitoring Standard 11513. This standard includes information about a staffing plan, that is, a plan for how the various locations in the facility are monitored and supervised by staff. The plan has to consider the unique challenges and needs of the facility's specialized populations, such as inmates who are female, LGBTI, disabled, limited English proficient, youthful inmates, or those who may have uh, medical or mental health needs. Um, and also those who may be at higher risk of victimization, thus requiring additional staffing resources to ensure their safety. These are the remaining standards that we will discuss today. Note that there are three medical and mental health standards, but we will talk about them all together. 
like, but like the other standards, I encourage you to review them all. Okay, so the first standard we will review is standard 115.15, limits to cross and reviewing and searches. This standard requires privacy protections for all inmates whenever they may be in a state of undress, such as when they shower, change their clothes, or use the bathroom. Unfortunately, absolute privacy is difficult to come by in confinement. But the standards recognize the importance of providing privacy balanced with safety and security. Security staff do have to conduct security checks. So an added requirement is that opposite gender staff must announce when they enter a housing unit. Say, for example, a female staff entering a male housing unit. This allows the inmates time to get clothed or to cover up in some fashion so the staff do not see them in a state of undress during security rounds. One thing I want to point out is remember that we talked about earlier about individuals who may be deaf or hard of hearing, they have to have alternate ways of letting them know um, about different things that are happening. So there must be some kind of indication to someone on those units to let them know that someone of the opposite gender is entering since they won't hear a verbal announcement. When talking with a client, they may tell you that staff watch them while they change their clothes or shower. You can speak with them more to better understand the situation. Is it a situation that during security rounds, staff have seen them changing clothes but move on to complete their rounds? Or is it a case of voyeurism where the staff is standing and leering for sexual gratification? If it's this latter case, then it's definitely sexual abuse. And there's a definition in the PREA standards about voyeurism. As the advocate, you can educate an inmate about the differences. If it does seem to be voyeurism and not just merely a staff person doing their job, um, doing security checks, then you can talk with the inmate about how to report and the steps the facility will take to investigate the incident. This standard goes on to talk about searches. Generally speaking, in adult prisons and jails, male staff can only pat search male inmates, while female staff can pat search both male and female inmates. Only staff of the same gender as the inmate can conduct a strip search. It would be especially important for advocates to clarify the search policy or protocol in place for the facility they are partnering with. The U.S. Department of Justice has issued interpretive guidance on how facilities can work with transgender and intersex inmates around searches. Best practice would be to allow the transgender or intersex inmate to decide with whom they feel most comfortable conducting their search, either a female or a male staff. This should then be documented and staff alerted in some way. Facilities are also allowed to have medical staff conduct the searches or to designate that only female staff conduct searches of transgender and intersex inmates. When meeting with clients, you may hear concerns about their searches. In particular, for transgender and intersex clients, I have explained the guidance DOJ has provided. Ask the facility what the policy or protocol is for searching these individuals. Ask if they can request which gender staff conducts their PAT searches and how that is documented and how staff are notified. This information will be helpful to you in talking with your client about their rights and facility policy and protocol. Staff are to receive training on conducting proper searches, including those of transgender and intersex individuals in a professional and respectful manner. What do these searches look like then in practice? For example, a transgender woman may have breasts, so staff conducting a pad search should search that inmate's chest as if they would a female inmate, even if it is in a male facility, that is, with the blade of their hand around the breast area. They should not run the back of their hand across the front of the inmate's breast. Furthermore, best practice directs staff to communicate what they are doing, what they are going to do during a search before they do it to alert the inmate. So for example, I am now going to search your waistband and then search the waistband. Listen to your clients, and if they are sharing practices that seem inappropriate for their gender, talk with them about how they can report these searches, or if they request, you can report on their behalf. The National Prayer Research, or the National Prayer Resource Center, along with its partner, the Moss Group, has released an instructional video and facilitator's guide on conducting professional and respectful cross-gender pat, pat searches and pat searches of transgender inmates. I encourage you to watch and review this video found on the PREA Resource Center website, especially if you have little experience with justice-involved survivors. At the end of the webinar today, we will provide you um, a, uh, a link to that. 
Also, specific protections are afforded in all sets of the PREA standards to people with mental illness, in, and especially in standard 115.16 for inmates with disabilities and inmates who are limited English proficient. The US Department of Justice commented on the release of the PREA standards in 2012, and I'm quoting, the final standard clarifies that agencies must make appropriate steps to ensure equal opportunity to participate in and benefit from all aspects of their efforts to prevent, detect, and respond to sexual abuse and sexual harassment for inmates with disabilities, including those with intellectual or psychiatric disabilities. Furthermore, standard 115.33 inmate education requires that information be readily available at all times, not just during intake and facility orientation, and that information be accessible to individuals, meaning that it is available in languages that people can understand and in formats that they can understand. Keep in mind too that no matter what language someone speaks, they may not be able to read in that language. So it is important that information be provided at least in a fifth grade reading level for all individuals. It is also recommended that videos use subtitles called open or closed captioning. This will further benefit individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing. The standards also prohibit the use of inmates to interpret for other inmates unless there is a situation where waiting to get an interpreter would compromise someone's safety. This is to prevent a situation where a prisoner takes advantage of someone they are translating for. Like was mentioned earlier, facilities have information in English and maybe in Spanish. For other languages, facilities need to know how they will be able to access translation services to make information available. This is often done through a language line. All inmates are to be screened for their risk of sexual victimization or abusiveness within 72 hours of their arrival at the facility and periodically throughout their confinement or whenever they move to a different facility within the agency. Standard 11541 describes the risk screening process. The information from this screening is used in, as part of the decision-making process for housing, bed, work, program, and education assignments. The tricky part of the screening is making sure that inmates feel comfortable answering the questions so there is a complete profile. Inmates who are unwilling to share for whatever reason may place them at an increased risk of victimization because the facility does not know all they should about them and added protections needed to keep them safe. This slide shows some of the kinds of information facilities want to collect about inmates. People may not want to disclose information for a variety of reasons, and they cannot be punished for refusing to answer the questions about the information on the slide. The facility, again, will use the information, excuse me, will not only use what the inmate shares, but also the screener's perceptions of the inmate's vulnerability to make placement decisions. This includes, but is not limited to, a screener's perception of the inmate, specifically the perception of whether they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or gender nonconforming, even if the inmate did not disclose any of this during the screening. This is often very tricky for staff who fear placing labels on individuals that are incorrect. But the intent of noting these perceptions is because the staff know the facility's population and if the population perceives someone to be gay, lesbian, bisexual, or gender nonconforming, these perceptions can be reality and this inmate be at risk of, may be at risk of sexual victimization as a result. For example, I learned at one agency that inmates were not disclosing previous sexual victimization or LGBTI status. This was perceived by the facility classification staff as there not being a large number of inmates with these backgrounds, with these identities, excuse me. But then we learned that inmates were instead choosing to disclose to medical. The real problem was that although the information was eventually coming out, medical had not been instructed to share the information back with classification. So again, those protections to keep them safe were not being put into place. Since that time, the agency has worked to allow medical to conduct the intake screening since inmates felt a greater level of comfort with these staff and then to share the information with classification who would use it to ensure their safety. Ultimately, facilities must use the information from the risk screening to make housing, bed, program, education, and work assignments with the goal of keeping all prisoners safe and free from sexual abuse. Placements of transgender and intersex inmates must be made in a case-by-case -case manner and cannot be made solely on their gender assigned at birth. The individual's perception of risk must also be considered. 
Knowing that transgender inmates may be housed based on their sex assigned at birth, there are some added protections for these inmates. First, a transgender intersex inmate cannot be searched to just to determine their genital status. Decisions about where a transgender inmate or an inmate with an intersex condition is housed must be made on a case-by-case -case basis, may not be made solely on the basis of someone's anatomy or birth assign sex assigned at birth, it also has to take into consideration the person's perception of safety. They must be reassessed at least twice per year and they must be allowed to shower separately. So as advocates, what does the screening and use of screening information mean for your interaction with clients? First, it can be important to learn from the facility the policy for how housing assignments are made for transgender and intersex individuals. Do they allow placement in a facility based on gender identity? Do they actually make placements based on this policy? You may hear from transgender clients that they explain their safety concerns, but were still housed in a facility based on their sex assigned at birth. It is important to share with clients that their perceptions of safety is one part of the overall placement making decision. Also share with them that they should be reassessed at least twice per year. And during the reassessment process, they can share their perceptions of safety. If a transgender inmate has concern for their safety before the next assessment, find out who they should talk with to share this concern. Facilities cannot isolate individuals to keep them safe, nor can they dedicate units to house only LGBTI prisoners. Facilities who involuntarily segregate, use involuntary segregated housing to keep an inmate safe must document the safety concern and why there's no other housing option available to keep them safe. They must allow segregated inmates access to programs, privileges, education, and work. They cannot keep the person isolated for more than 30 days and they are not to extend the isolation beyond that 30 days without an evaluation. As advocates, listen to your clients and how they are being housed. If they share that they are being housed in isolating conditions for their safety, talk with them about their understanding of why this decision was made. Talk with them about requesting an reassessment or if they want you to advocate on their behalf to have their housing assignment reevaluated. JDI also hears from survivors that medical and mental health care they receive after being sexually abused can be inadequate or non-existent and that medical and mental health care providers have lacked the specialized training or experience to work with them as survivors of sexual abuse. This has been supported by comments and letters to JDI where survivors describe being treated in ways that can be defined as victim blaming, dismissive of common survivor concerns, or just frankly inappropriate, such as being medicated when what they're exhibiting are expected trauma reactions and not a mental illness. While the PREA standards allow survivors to request help getting advocates, met medical to getting adequate medical or mental health care, the standards don't speak to the nature and type of mental health to be provided to survivors other than, <coughs> excuse me, the timeline of services and access following a sexual abuse incident while incarcerated. For individuals that disclose prior sexual abuse during intake, they are to receive a follow-up meeting with medical or mental health care within 14 days of arrival. This is to determine what, if any, follow-up care the individual may need to continue to support them in their healing. The standards do stress that individuals receive care that is, in, that is the same as a community level of care, and any medical or mental health services related to sexual abuse and confinement be provided free of charge. Lastly, after an investigation of sexual abuse occurs or concludes, the facility has 30 days to conduct an incident review. The intent of the review is to determine if there are factors that played into the incident of sexual abuse that could be mitigated to prevent future incidents. This includes looking at where the incident occurred to determine if there needs to be more supervision, evaluating the staffing levels for that day and whether or not they fell below what is expected for that post, as well as monitoring or changes to the physical plan. It is also to determine if there are certain characteristics that may have contributed to the incident such things as race, ethnicity, gender identity, LGBTI status or perceived status or gang affiliation. The facility must create an action plan to make changes to protect at-risk individuals to prevent future incidents from occurring.
Okay, again, that was a lot of information today. Um, so I'm sure that you have questions. So I'll turn things back over to Gabriella to see what questions we have. So we do have a question. What are policies around video cameras and showers and other private areas? Example, a men's facility that has security cameras filming in a shower facility, supposedly only videoing from the waist up, but then a trans woman with breasts in the shower being videoed. Um, well, I definitely want to have Lisa chime in on this, but there shouldn't be any uh, cameras uh, videoing in the bathroom areas. So um, in a couple of webinars, we will talk about the PREA audit. And one of the things an auditor will do is that they will go in and they will ask to review um, the camera angles. So there are certainly some um, cells, for example, that have a toilet inside the cell. And yes, there may be uh, cameras pointing, uh, facing that cell. Um, and, and so what you would do, so as an auditor, you want to see that if, if someone is sitting on and using the toilet, right, again, that's a state of undress, that um, it is not, you know, that, that nothing is being able to be seen while that person is using the toilet. Um, what typically happens is, what I have seen in my experience is that video, uh, that cameras are that people aren't necessarily videoing inside cells unless it's someone who is on um, suicide watch. Um, cameras are typically placed in other areas. Um, and again, cameras should not be placed inside bathroom areas to monitor people showering. Um, now there may be a camera that's angled so you can see people entering and exiting a shower area, but typically there are multiple showers um, and it's staff responsibility to be going in and monitoring um, to make sure that there are, you know, it's just one person in a shower at a time. Um, so there should be some kind of privacy screen or door whereby you can see someone's feet and you can see their head, but you couldn't see the rest of their body while they're showering. Um, so I don't know, I, I hope that helps answer the question. And I don't know if Lisa, if you're still there, if, if you have thoughts as well to add. Yeah. Uh Thank you, Tara. There are a lot of ways that um, facilities will uh, utilize different things, um, like you said, uh, privacy screens, uh, curtains. Um, often I've seen where facilities will have um, a curtain, one that you can see the number of feet underneath, but then it um, it does cover up the midsection and then you can only see that person's head and I totally agree you're not going to have a facility that's going to have a camera angle inside the showers themselves but of course to see uh, who's entering and exiting that area and you would want um, staff to monitor that. Uh, I've also seen some facilities that use cameras that have uh, fixed um, blinders electronically, uh, especially for areas um, where they have multiple gender staff that are uh, watching these cameras. So if they do have those individuals that, you know, they're covering up. Um, also, if they have an area like the toilet where an inmate um, could be seen in a state of undress using the toilet, maybe they're taking out their jumpsuit especially for females, um, that they offer, you know, they have those individuals, um, they'll have sports bras or things of that nature so that they can remain covered and their breasts are not visible to those monitoring that area. All right, we have another question. Um, why would you be using a video in a prison setting? Tara, go ahead, I can Lisa. go ahead. Yeah, and, go ahead. All right. Uh, so oftentimes, um, videos and camera monitoring, it's supplemental to the supervision. Um, and depending on the type of pl physical plant structure, and whether it's a dorm setting, a linear setting, uh, different, different cells um, or open area, these facilities are going to utilize videos to monitor these areas and it's actually something um, that is quite useful um, especially in the case of investigations 
And like Tara had said previously, the auditor will look at those to see if um, that is something that can be helpful. And if they've used that for investigations and different things of that nature. Um, but again, it is a, a safety uh, support for, for the facility. And, um, you know, especially in areas where there may be blind spots, um, video monitoring is very useful uh, for prisons and jails. Yeah, and I, I certainly have seen a wide variety of quality in the, the cameras. Um, you know, some are still black and white, some are very grainy, some may be in color, but, you know, they may be, they may ha not have the ability to zoom. Um, so it's hard to see real detail. Um, you know, the most advanced are, um, you know, not only in color, but there's also audio attached. Um, and it also varies widely in terms of a facility's ability to uh, retain that information, especially if they haven't converted over to digital recording. Um, and you may think like, how, how could this be 2020 and facilities still be using like tapes of some sort, but it's absolutely true. Um, a lot of places have converted over to digital, but even at that, they have to be able to store the information. So. Um, there's a wide variety. It may be, you know, 15 days, it may be 30 days, it may be 60 days, it could be indefinite. Um, but every, I feel like every facility I go to has a different policy for retention of that information. Um, yeah, anyway, sorry. There's, there's a lot to say about monitoring technology, um, but we'll, we'll just leave it at that unless others have additional questions. Right. It doesn't look like we have any additional questions. Okay. Um, great. Well, I, you know, again, we will be doing, um, I'm going to review a few, some different resources um, that we'll have available for you. Um, again, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, NC CASA or JDI and we'll have that contact information at the end as well if you do have questions. Remember, this is just part one. So when we come back from 4th of July, on July 7th, we will have the part two of this webinar. And that will really take a look at how you as advocates can work um, effectively with uh, various populations of clients in a confinement setting. Um, so with that, let me scroll to the next slide. Um, so a few webinars, or a few resources, excuse me, um, there's the OVW webinar series, Vulnerable and Underserved, which I mentioned. Um, there are a variety of different populations that are covered in those webinars, so you can feel free to access those. Um, we also have No One Left Behind, so again, providing resources to incarcerated survivors. There is a resource uh, that was created in partnership between the Vera Institute of Justice and the National Career Resource Center called Making Priya and Victim Services Accessible for Incarcerated People with Disabilities. Um, it's a really great hands-on practical guide um, that you may find useful as well. Um, again, here is the link to the cross-gender and transgender PAT searches. There's both a video and a facilitator guide. Um, it's free, again, it was developed uh, with the Moss Group in collaboration with the National Priya Resource Center. Um, there's also a link here for the Prius standards in focus. This, this, what they've done is they've gone through, and not every standard is there yet, but they've been going through standard by standard and saying, you know, this is what the standard says, this is the intent of the standard, um, this is what it looks like implementation-wise, and here are some challenges. So it's a really comprehensive, some of them are quite long um, guide, but each standard. So you could dig into each of the standards mentioned today in a little bit more detail. Um, and then lastly, uh, a link here for um, mental health disorder statistics, just to supplement uh, the information that we spoke about today. Um, for more information about JDI, feel free to go to our website. Um, you can always email us with questions at advocate at justdetention.org. Um, you can also reach out, we have, um, through different, a different grant, we have uh, funding available for training and technical assistance, so you're always welcome to reach out to us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gabriella for um, information about NC CASA and Closeout. So thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. Um, if you have any questions um, surrounding Priya, please reach out to Robin Colbert, our Associate Director 
and Courtney Dunkerton, our anti-human trafficking specialist. Um, and uh, just a reminder, um, we will be sending out webinar certificates for every single webinar that you attend at NC CASA during this time. Um, so please look out for an email from training at NC CASA about um, getting a certificate for this webinar. You will have one week to register for it. And um, after that date, we will send it out. Um, we really hope to see everyone back here on July 7th and we hope that you have a great day. Bye.